we are now ready to talk about metamorphic rocks. And over the next week and a half, I'll be discussing places like Mount Shuxon here, where this rock and others like it in the North Cascades represent metamorphic processes. In the case of Mount Shuxon, it's a green schist rock, which was originally oceanic crust, both basalt and sedimentary cover over the basalt. But before we can talk about Mount Shuxon or any other metamorphic province, we need to look at some of the fundamentals. And so I begin the set of videos on metamorphic processes by talking about thermodynamics. This video is dedicated to thermodynamics. After that, I'll go into an overview of the metamorphic minerals, followed by talking about metamorphic processes and giving you some examples and finally relating metamorphism to plate tectonics. So the reading associated with this first video can be found in sections 14.2 and 14.3. In particular, I want to talk about Gibbs energy and equilibrium in chemical systems. Then I'll talk about the phase rule and petrogenetic grids, pseudosections, and how petrologists have learned to interpret metamorphic rocks using a set of thermodynamic tools. So let's begin with the assumptions. We have to start by invoking equilibrium. And I've talked about equilibrium in an earlier video, and that's basically a statement that the collection of minerals and gases and fluids in any system that has the lowest Gibbs energy is the equilibrium uh, assemblage. And natural systems will achieve equilibrium if there are no kinetic barriers. And we've already discussed examples of kinetic barriers. For instance, the transition from diamond to graphite involves a, a substantial kinetic bar barrier. Otherwise, without the barrier, we would never see diamonds at the Earth's surface. So to get equilibrium, we generally need time and the time allows chemical species to move through a rock mass to get where they're needed. The process of moving chemical species through a rock system is controlled by diffusion. Furthermore, if minerals need to change into other minerals, that involves changes in structure and time is needed for minerals to re-equilibrate to change their structure. So the bottom line is that you may not see perfect equilibrium in a rock. For instance, kyanite may persist into the silimonite stability field. Remember, kyanite and silimonite are aluminosilicates, which we'll use uh, as additional examples in this video. Kyanite is the high pressure uh, phase where silimonite exists at higher temperature. So you increase the temperature and you should convert kyanite into silimonite. But because there's a small difference in the Gibbs energy between kyanite and silimonite, there's a small driving force to cause kyanite to move into the silimonite structure. Furthermore, silimonite structure is different from kyanite enough that it takes a time, it takes a while for the structure to change over from one to the other. Now, the other assumption we have to make is that the geologic system we're looking at is a closed system. And again, what does a closed system mean? It means that no chemicals enter or leave some box in which we're studying the collection of minerals and other materials. So now, where does that leave us? Real systems are dynamic. There are materials coming in and out of the system. Furthermore, real materials can often show disequilibrium. Where does that leave us? Well, an analysis based on equilibrium is useful. It provides information. And what kind of information does it provide? Well, it does tell you what would be present if given a chance. And it also tells you how things ought to change 
from where they are now. All of this we could call a description of chemical pathways. And ultimately, knowing the pathways of a system allows you to interpret what you see and what we in the end will want to interpret is tectonic events, both their events in time and events in space. So where do we begin? We have to begin with fundamentals of thermodynamics and the concept that I want to introduce is that of the chemical potential. Now in a mixture of chemicals, each chemical contributes to the Gibbs energy of the system in proportion to its concentration. Very simple idea. It contributes in proportion to the amount of it that you have in the system. So we can write an equation for this and for the ith chemical component we could have any number of chemical components but if we consider just one its contribution to Gibbs energy G sub i is equal to this Greek letter mu times n with subscript i. How we interpret this equation is that the G is the Gibbs energy, the mu is something called chemical potential and N is its concentration. Typical measurement of concentration would be the number of moles of the material. So chemical formula says as you increase the number of moles you increase the Gibbs energy. The constant of proportionality is the chemical potential. Now let's use this in an example and I'll, I'll pick on the plagioclase feldspars. You'll remember there is a change of, of composition as you go from albite to anorthite. The change in composition involves a substitution of calcium for sodium and at the same time a coupled substitution of aluminum for silicon. So we have four things that are changing in the system and a way to represent the Gibbs energy for the system is to focus on what changes and so G for the system is equal to the chemical potential of the calcium times the concentration of the calcium plus chemical potential of the sodium times its concentration plus the chemical potential of the silicon times its concentration plus the chemical potential of the aluminum times its concentration the sum of all of those chemical contributions then gives the chemical contribution to Gibbs energy. And on to that then you would add the pressure temperature contributions which are PV and TS. So the total Gibbs energy represents the sum of all this and the equilibrium phase would be the phase that has the smallest value of these. So let's move on now to thermodynamic representations. Gibbs energy depends on pressure, temperature, composition. Now it's easy enough to plot Gibbs energy as a function of pressure and temperature. I can draw some axes like this. I can have Gibbs on the vertical axis and pressure and temperature on the horizontal axis. Gibbs energy in this plot is just a surface in space. So this works for Gibbs energy varying only with pressure and temperature. Now that we add compositional variables, we're in trouble. Adding even one compositional variable that changes means we need another axis on this plot. And we've run out of axes in three dimensions. So what to do? Well, we're going to have to consistently be clever and choose ways of projecting more dimensions onto the number of dimensions that we can actually plot. Now it's possible to plot in three dimensions but it's awkward. We usually want to eventually get a plot down to a two-dimensional plot that we can put on a piece of paper.